Kalayan is going to talk about how his institution did the um, uh, the construction. Michael, you're on. Go ahead. Thanks, Herman. Uh, thanks, everybody, for attending today. Uh, especially uh, thanks to Herman. I've run into him at shows over the years. He's always uh, very approachable, very friendly, and uh, uh, very wise, as many of you may already know. Uh, as Herman mentioned, uh, uh, I was part of a deconstructive PACS implementation within the VA system. Uh, I recently left government service after 32 years from the Iowa City VA. So you see on the map, uh, Iowa, Minnesota, the Dakotas, and Nebraska are part of VISION 23. VISION stands for the uh, Veterans Integrated Service Network. So when I say VISION, you can think of it as Integrated Delivery Network, uh, whatever fits in, in your space. Uh, uh, when I say network, I'm talking about VISION. They're sort of interchangeable. Uh, we, it consists of uh, 11 distinct campuses across those five states in the picture. Uh, the largest site is uh, Minneapolis with 130,000 uh, studies. On the next slide, you'll see uh, uh, we have about a half million uh, studies a year total across the enterprise. Our, our legacy PAC system was BRIT systems, uh, originally installed in Minneapolis in 2004, uh, rolled out across the rest of our uh, network 2007-2008. Uh, the delay was uh, not vendor related, it was uh, internal government uh, budgeting and timelining. Uh, it was just uh, challenging uh, to get that uh, done internally. Uh, we did add hardware in Minneapolis in roughly 2010. It might have been a year prior or after. Added an additional server in Minneapolis in 2010. Our hardware was uh, actively expiring uh, with just uh, aged hardware. Um, and so we made a decision internally to go with the deconstructed packs. Um, prior to going with the deconstructed packs, uh, I just wanted to point out some of the components that we had in place already, and Herman referenced, you know, for instance, uh, modality work list. We, prior to our decision uh, to go with a deconstructed PACS, we switched over to a modality work list. And what this allowed us to do was to get all of our modalities configured to get the work list from a provider. Uh, if we were to switch, you know, or if we upgrade, we do whatever, we don't have to go back to the modalities, reconfigure the uh, modality work list. Um, we, uh, prior to this, we uh, procured an HL7 uh, engine from CorePoint Healthcare. Uh, it ingests all of the HL7 messages from the distinct, uh, uh, six distinct VISTA systems across our enterprise VISTA is the VA's uh, computer system. And uh, uh, CorePoint would disperse those HL7 messages to our various uh, HL7 consumers across the enterprise. Uh, we ingest our studies via uh, Compass DICOM router. We, uh, Compass was used extensively uh, by us in Iowa City uh, for uh, a number of years back. It propagated across our enterprise, and uh, we uh, were ingesting studies via uh, DICOM router. Uh, what that, again, allows you to do is you don't have to go back to your modalities, reconfigure everything. You can multiplex out of that uh, DICOM router uh, offload to the new archive as needed. Uh, across the enterprise, you had a mix of CD burners and importers. There's an old saying that if you've seen one VA, you've seen one VA. Uh, while our VISTA systems are very consistent uh, across the nation, uh, even within our enterprise, there is variations in workflows and solutions at the uh, different facilities. So you'll see, uh, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, while we try to standardize a lot of our processes, uh, sometimes a little innovation can be a good thing. So if somebody finds something good at one of our facilities, uh, we can easily propagate that everywhere. Uh, uh, PACS gear document scanning, uh, pretty deep penetration across our enterprise. We use Nuance PowerScribe for voice recognition. And uh, several years back, we completed uh, the uh, installation of Terra Recon, uh, their intuition advanced visualization that's present on all of our campuses. Um, the main elements of our deconstructed packs, we have Visage Imaging for uh, diagnostic and enterprise viewing. That's one application that does both functions. Uh, the, the features can be restricted per, per user class. Lexmark Accuos are VNA. We have uh, data centers in Minneapolis and Omaha that are replicated. Uh, each site that is not a data center has a three-year cache uh, uh, for the uh, Accuo VNA. We went with Metacalus for our 
uh, work list provision. Uh, so that gives us an enterprise or vision-wide integrated radiologist work list. Uh, for our, to give you a, a look at our facility map, uh, the next slide shows the five state area and kind of geographically where everyone is located. I'm showing the arrow between Omaha and Minneapolis indicating that uh, that is the, uh, uh, between those two sites we have the highest bandwidth capability and so it made sense uh, to place our data centers in those locations uh, and uh, as you can see in Minneapolis we have a data center, it has its own busy server. Omaha is where we ended up placing a lot of our uh, ancillary uh, uh, servers because they had the space and the personnel to man it, it just made sense to put it there. So in addition to the uh, data center and busy server, we have our core point server located in Omaha. Uh, that again ingests all of the HL7 messages from each of the state VISTA instances. We have our PowerScribe server and Pax Connect server located there. At the remaining sites uh, that are not data centers, there are six of them listed there. We have the VISI server and the Accuel cache. And then at three of the sites, uh, Lincoln, Grand Island, and Hot Springs. Uh, those sites, we just left uh, Compass DICOM routers in place to ingest the, uh, uh, the images from the modalities. Uh, they would offload to the adjacent uh, site. So in Hot Springs, it goes up to Fort Meade, where we have the, the uh, VISI server and the VNA. And in Grand Island and Lincoln, they offload to Omaha. Originally, we did have a VISI server in Lincoln. It really didn't make sense to continue using that because we were able to, to see the images and move the images so well from Omaha for, for uh, readers in uh, Lincoln that we uh, repurposed the server that was located in Lincoln and split it out with the, you know, the, uh, the servers in other places in the vision. We began our implementation in Iowa City in September of 2014. We completed all sites by um, August of 2015. Here's a uh, diagram of a, a data flow in uh, the Iowa City Institution. <clears throat> this is not atypical, but again, as I said, uh, different VAs would have different uh, solutions for this. As you can see, we have the HL7 integration engine. The red line indicates that it's sending its HL7 uh, messages to the three major components there in the middle, the imaging workflow, uh, enterprise viewer, and VNA. And then uh, it also offloads to our PAX Connect, the modality work list. That starts uh, through the modality layer. Uh, again, we're going to ingest our studies uh, from the modality layer into a DICOM router uh, for uh, tying standardization, uh, multiplexing of studies. <clears throat> uh, you have a choice with the deconstructed PAX, as uh, many of you may have considered. Uh, you, can, you can go directly to your VNA, and the VNA can service you know, whatever viewers you might have. In our case, it worked best for us to go to the, uh, to the viewer, uh, the viewing solution cache, and it would offload it to the VNA. Uh, as you can see, uh, the VNA will offload to our data centers. Uh, it can go to either one. They're replicated. If one drops, it will offload to the other. Uh, then from the VNA cache on site, we'll offload to a deep archive called Vista Imaging. And, um, this imaging, for those of you who aren't familiar with the VH architecture, it is a homegrown uh, VA-created image archive, and we are mandated uh, in the VA system. And I guess I should qualify. When I say we, I, I mean my former employees uh, in the VA system are mandated to archive images into Vista Imaging. And this can present some challenges because Vista Imaging has some shortcomings in as much as it is not able to process study updates, splits, merges, etc. So uh, to fix a study that uh, comes into Vista Imaging that may have a misidentified image or a mismarked image, uh, to, the fix is to delete it and, and re-archive uh, it. So we put a delay in place between our viewer and our VNA and holds it for, you know, It'll vary by site, but one, two hours, a half a day before we put it to the VNA, and then the VNA will then go ahead and offload it to the to the deep archive. That allows most of the studies, if there were an error, to be fixed. Again, we are running those before they go to this imaging. They're going to go through that uh, DICOM router again. I show two DICOM routers here. 
Uh, I couldn't diagram it well enough uh, to, to show it. It's actually just one di uh, one dicom router at most of our sites. It's one dicom router to both ingest the studies from the modality layer and we run through the dicom router on the way to Vista Imaging. Uh, that is uh, in order. There are some uh, SOP classes that won't store the Vista Imaging, so we uh, sort those out. Uh, the green line indicates uh, offloading the uh, volumetric images, the submillimeter slices, uh, to our uh, volumetric imaging or advanced visualization server. At our site, now this varies by site, but in, in Iowa City, our radiologists preferred not to have the submillimeter series in their list of, of series or what they would pull up. They wanted it available, and if they wanted, they could go view it directly on the, the, the uh, uh, Terra Recon, which is our viewer, or they could pull the images back uh, right in their workstation and, and view the volumetric images or the thin slice data uh, right in our uh, diagnostic viewer. Uh, we, again, archive those off to Vista Imaging. I put a time delay on the DICOM router uh, and offload those, the thin slice, submillimeter slice into Vista Imaging after hours. And so that is uh, pretty much the uh, overview of uh, what one site's uh, uh, flow. As you can see up at the top, uh, the list of prefetch engine, uh, that was unique to Iowa City. It was something I had to come up with. I'll explain that in a later slide. We can go on to the challenges that uh, we experienced uh, in, in bringing this system up. As I mentioned earlier, we were at the uh, end of hardware life with our legacy packs. And uh, again, this can happen, uh, I suppose, in many institutions in the government system in the VA. You just, it's just a fact of life that you run into challenges with, you know, trying to get the funding and trying to get it in the pipeline and trying to get things bought. And uh, so these are the things that happens. And, and uh, so we were not really able to wait for a full migration process. We had to get this out and get started. And so we began uh, an ad hoc or an on-the-fly migration. Uh, it's not ideal to do it this way. Uh, ideally, you'd like everything migrated before you flip the switch. But I think this uh, is probably more commonplace than many might expect. Uh, another big challenge for us was we were not able to use our enterprise viewer at the outset because uh, we had some required internal VA approvals that weren't met, and that was kind of sprung on uh, me as we were beginning to roll out. So that presented some challenges because we had to keep uh, both uh, PAC systems in sync, and you can imagine that that can be uh, a challenge. So we had to, you know, do some work, make sure that we were keeping those in sync, and we had to do that for from uh, September to February actually before we were able to bring up the enterprise viewer. Uh, so that that uh, was a challenge and in fact we weren't able to go to the next site until after we had successfully brought up the enterprise viewer so the second site didn't go up until April of 2015. Uh, one of the features in quotes of our Vista Histories is that you don't get an HL7 message until the patient is actually registered in the risk for the exam. Uh, that means you can't prefetch. You can't prefetch based on an order or a scheduling event. We only get the HL7 message at registration. Uh, so uh, that's not ideal. Uh, so in our challenges, con to continue with our challenges, uh, in order to uh, manage this issue uh, in Iowa City in particular, I had to come up with some way of prefetching. So uh, working with uh, Laurel Bridge, they have a solution navigator that I worked out with them to use for a jacket prefetch. Now normally uh, you would like to not do a full jacket prefetch, you know, especially in production hours or uh, we, did, we did this after hours, but uh, we found that, you know, sometimes the DICOM body parts weren't good enough when you're doing a query or the descriptions weren't pristine enough and, and so we uh, just ended up pulling a whole jacket. It was too much of a hassle if we missed studies to go back and get them. Um, not all of our DICOM tags were consistent from our modalities, um, particularly the institution name. Uh, it was just an irritation. You know, we tried to have a consistent policy across our vision when we had installed new uh, uh, modalities. They had to follow our, our uh, institution naming convention. Didn't always happen. Uh, body part examined at the modality level. Uh, you know, we try to be consistent. Sometimes you have a chest abdomen CT and, you know, we'll give a body part of chest to a study that had abdomens on it. Uh, and name elements, uh, particularly for imported studies, would be, you know, uh, not pristine. And so we had to find ways to manage that. We had to tweak some study descriptions in our risks. Uh, for instance, uh, 
you would register a CT chest and a CT abdomen pelvis for one patient and do all the acquisitions under the one uh, study. So when you would look at, on our uh, viewing solution at the study list for that patient, it would show CT chest and a radiologist or a, any other person looking at just that list wouldn't really know for sure if there were uh, abdomen and pelvis images associated with that. So we went back to our source into the wrist and we created a number of uh, uh, synonyms kind of contained within the study description. Uh, many of you are familiar with uh, this where it would be uh, CA for chest abdomen or CAP for chest abdomen and pelvis. Uh, that was a significant rework. Uh, but I think there was significant benefit from that. Uh, the other challenge we had was uh, uh, several users were retrieving full patient jackets uh, during production hours, uh, both radiologists and technologists, uh, trying to be helpful. Uh, and it seemed really fast to just grab the entire jacket and pull it back. And uh, it was really fast until it wasn't fast. And so uh, we had to address that with some uh, education. It didn't happen again. It was just uh, one day we found out, oh, they're doing this, and, and we fixed it. Uh, so those were the primary challenges. Our successes uh, uh, enhanced radiologists uh, cross enterprise coverage. So we were able to add some more facilities and add them quickly. We had cross facility reads with our uh, legacy packs. We were able to do that. But uh, with the uh, uh, unified work list, it was really a lot easier to add another facility. It would just spin up the viewer for that facility, the radiologist. It was absolutely transparent to them. Uh, when they were going to read from another facility, they'd launch that work list and it would, you know, launch the viewer and they didn't, you know, really even notice it. It was pretty much transparent. Um, the other success was the tight integration between the viewer and the VNA. Uh, I, I guess it goes without saying that that should happen, uh, but I was pleased that it did happen for us. Our vendors worked very well. They worked very hard. They made it work. Uh, they're using a web service integration uh, between the, our viewer and VNA. Uh, not uh, IOCM, although I'm, I'm told that uh, uh, Visage now supports IOCM. Uh, but anyway, with extensive testing across the enterprise, our annotation, merges, uh, splits, etc., worked uh, really quite well. Uh, easier viewing of the images across facility boundaries, as you might imagine, with brand new hardware and the latest software in all our facilities, obviously, yes, it made it easier to view images across facility boundaries. Uh, we had really uh, problem free uh, uh, adoption of the busy enterprise viewer. Just as a, a funny story, is, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we had to wait until February before we could roll out the enterprise uh, install on the enterprise desktop. And so the day we rolled it out and went live with it, uh, we in our PACS office were waiting for the deluge of phone calls we were going to get. Although we had published it, that it was coming, we went around with the tip sheets and put it in high, high use areas and uh, never got a phone call, and I actually had to go walk around the hospital and ask people if they were actually using the viewer. Um, so that is, uh, that was good. <laughs> it, was a, it was a big relief for us, and, and I don't think that was unique to just uh, Iowa City. Uh, that, was, uh, that happened at other facilities as well. It was well received, uh, easily adopted. Uh, as a result of our migration and the efforts we made in, in tag morphing uh, using our evaluative uh, router. We were able to clean up some of the tags, uh, get our institution names uh, pristine, uh, body part examined. We did some extensive uh, tag rights uh, and have made the body part examine uh, work better. Uh, you know, with our VNA partner and their, and their migration uh, uh, contractor, a lot of data cleansing happened as we migrate studies. So uh, as a result of this process, and I think this would happen, honestly, whether you were doing uh, traditional packs or deconstructive packs. If you're doing a migration, if you're starting fresh, you're going to see you know, where you can make improvements. And so we were able to do that. Uh, again, the server-side rendering uh, allowed really nearly instantaneous viewing of images from remote sites uh, and with minimal bandwidth requirements. It actually worked. It worked quite well. Uh, again, uh, all that said, you know, with brand new hardware, uh, you know, you would at least expect that. In summary, our vendors did work remarkably well together. We proved that a deconstructed PAX is feasible even in the sometimes challenging environment of the VA. Um, the support issue of one throat to choke, uh, many people have heard that at different shows, uh, but I think PAX administrators have to triage problems regardless of the type of PAX system you have. Uh, knowing a call didn't really present a big challenge for us. Uh, 
in, in discussions with my colleagues in the VA, with colleagues across the industry, implementing and supporting a deep constructed PACS requires, I think, a much more advanced skill set for your local PACS administrators and other support personnel. Uh, I, you can make a case that you should have those skill sets regardless of the type of PACS system that you have, but uh, it should go without saying you have several issues and complex interactions uh, that you're going to need a, a, a better skill set among uh, your, your local support. And with that, I'll end my portion of the uh, uh, discussion.